All right, welcome to lecture 40. In this lecture, we're going to talk about improvements to the Brayton power cycle. This will be our last technical lecture. The next lecture will just be an overview of the course. The picture that you have on the screen here is of a turboshaft engine used to power the M1 Abrams tank. It's a gas turbine style engine, so it operates on a Brayton cycle, produces 1500 horsepower. If you want to learn more about it, you can go ahead and Google it, but it's relevant to today's material. In addition, I have a couple of videos that I posted here. The first one is a video without any audio that shows how a regenerator works. It's kind of a slow one, so you may want to increase the speed of it. The second one is from GE and talks a bit about producing power from gas turbines. And it also has a little bit on a combined cycle at the very end where you take a Brayton cycle and combine it with a steam vapor power cycle. So both short videos you can take a look at. So we're going to talk about three different things in this lecture. We're going to talk about intercooling, reheating, and regeneration. And they'll all refer back to this picture. So this is a complicated picture of a Brayton cycle with these various improvements. Here, let me just walk you through it. So on this side, we have two compressors. Actually, it's two stages of a compressor. So think of this as the compressor. And then over here, we have the turbine. We have a shaft that connects everything so we can get some power out. So you've seen this sort of thing before for the Brayton cycle that you have a compressor and turbines on the same shaft. It's just now we've broken it up into two compressors and two turbine stages. We still have a combustor down here and we still have a heat exchanger that gets rid of the waste heat. We have three new pieces in here. We have a heat exchanger here, an additional combustor here, and a thing called a regenerator which is just really another heat exchanger. So the idea is this, we start with state one, we go into a first stage compressor. Once we go through that compressor, we go through a heat exchanger where we take some heat out. So recall that the compressor, the temperature goes up through the compressor, the, the pressure and temperature both go up, but we remove some of that heat so that the temperature drops down and then we go through another compressor. So this is a two stage compressor. And then after that compressor, we go through uh, what's called a regenerator, and I'll, I'll come back to this, but this is basically a heat exchanger where we pull energy from a hot stream coming out of the last turbine, take that energy and put it into the working fluid before it goes into the combustor. So it's, it's essentially preheating the working fluid before we go into the combustor. So we go from the compressor through this heat exchanger called a regenerator, we go into the combustor and of course we add in energy through some sort of typically a chemical reaction but it may be something else. Then we add energy in so the combustor is the same as as always. Then we go into the turbine just like usual except now we have a two-stage turbine. So we go through this first turbine stage and then as we come out of it we go through another combustor. This is called reheating. So the, the heat exchanger here is called intercooling. This combustor here is, is called reheating. So when we come out of the turbine, the temperature is dropped and the pressure is dropped, but we go through this combustor to add in more energy to bring the temperature back up. And then we go through the second stage turbine. And then finally we come out of that second stage turbine, but the working fluid is still pretty warm here as we come out of the second stage turbine. And so what we do is we go through this regenerator, again it's like a heat exchanger, and we pull some of that energy out of that hot stream and put it into the stream going into the combustor. So we're using that that waste stream coming out of the turbine, taking that energy out and, put, and using it to preheat the fluid before it goes into the combustor. And then as we come out of the regenerator we go through another heat exchanger to remove heat to the surroundings. That's a typical part of a, any cycle, including a Brayton cycle. And then we repeat the cycle. So we have three different components in here that make it look complicated. The heat exchanger here used for intercooling between the compressor stages. The combustor we use for reheating between the turbine stages and a regenerator. Now, you might ask yourself, why do we do this intercooling or reheating? What does it give us? Well, to understand that, we need to go back to this expression that we derived I think it was in lecture 32 where we combine the first law, second law, and the TDS equations. And we combine them together and assumed that we were dealing with a steady state flow with single inlet and single outlet, negligible changes in kinetic and potential energy. When you go through all that, you get that the specific work, 
remember the specific work is just the the power divided by the mass flow rate. So the specific work, or work per unit mass, is equal to minus integral of specific volume times the change in pressure integrated as you go from state one to state two. Or if you want to, I think it's a little easier for the compressor stage to, instead of talking about the work, specific work coming out, you can call it the specific work coming in. If I do that, then I just change the sign here. So the specific work in is the integral of the specific volume times the pressure integrated over the inlet to the outlet. This is kind of a key expression. I'm going to highlight it and we're going to refer to it. I'll highlight both. Okay, so let's talk about intercooling. So the intercooling refers to this heat exchanger up here where we're pulling some heat out of the, the working fluid as we go between compressor stages. So intercooling occurs between successive compressor stages and we use it to decrease that specific volume of the working fluid. So just refer to this expression here. What we're trying to do is decrease that specific volume. You can see this from the ideal gas loss. So PV equals RT if I just rearrange it so I solve for the specific volume. Recall that through a heat exchanger and through a heat exchanger the pressure remains constant. So for pressure being constant if the temperature of the working fluid goes down, our working fluid is air here, if the temperature goes down, then the specific volume will go down, right? So pulling some heat out of this will allow the temperature in here of the working fluid to go down, which gives the specific volume going down. And then if you refer back to this equation, this is the specific work that you have to put into the compressors. If that specific volume is smaller, then the specific work will be smaller. So now you can see that here. So the idea here is that if we do some intercooling between compressor stages, so we're, we're just reducing the specific volume of the working fluid, then we don't have to put quite as much power into the compressor to drive it. Right? This, remember, this is the power that we have to put into the compressor to operate it. So if we can keep that specific volume smaller, through intercooling, then we don't have to put as much power into the compressor. So that's why intercooling is done, is to reduce the amount of power we need to drive the compressor stages. We can do a similar idea for reheating. So reheating occurs between successive turbine stages, and it's used to increase the specific volume of the working fluid. So that's this one here. We're, we're burning a little fuel to keep the temperature higher as we go from one turbine stage to the next. Again, if you go to the ideal gas law, Specific volume is uh, equal to RT over the pressure for pressure being constant. Remember, through a combustor, the pressure remains constant. Temperature goes up, then the specific volume is going to go up. And if the specific volume goes up, we can refer to this equation. This is the specific work out from the turbine. If you increase the specific volume, then you get work coming out. You get additional specific work. So the idea is to increase that specific volume so we can get additional work out of the turbine stage. Okay, So it's the same idea as intercooling, but we call it reheating because we're putting energy in. In order to do this, you have to burn a little more fuel. So this reheating doesn't really improve the efficiency of the thermal efficiency of your cycle. The reason for that is even though you get a little more work out, you're also putting heat in, and it's not a big improvement to your thermal efficiency because remember when you calculate thermal efficiency it's the net workout so it does help getting additional power out from your turbine but you divide through by the heat that you put in so you're putting a little more heat in you still have the heat from this combustor the main combustor but from reheating you're putting some heat transfer in so it's not a big help in terms of efficiency but it does help you in terms of getting more work out of your turbines so that you don't have to have turbines that are as large and so you can reduce material costs and if it's an aircraft you don't have to have as big of an engine which is desirable. So that's intercooling and reheating. Okay so now we have the working fluid leaving the second stage turbine in this picture and it goes through the regenerator. So let me go to the picture for the regenerator here. I'm going to refer to the regenerator here. So they, this is state 4, state X, state 8, and state Y. That corresponds to these states up in here. So if you look at this, here's state 4 leading in, state X coming out, state 8 going here, state Y going here. Y, X, and Y, that's just the convention that your textbook uses, so I'm using it here as well. Okay, so the regenerator is really just a, a heat exchanger. Okay, 
And what we're doing is we're taking that hot gas that's coming out of the last stage of the turbine. It still has a fairly high temperature. That's why I've drawn it red here to indicate that it's still kind of hot. And it's going through this heat exchanger. And then you have the flow coming out of the compressor going into the combustor. That's this line here, state four. That's still relatively cold going through the heat exchanger. So we exchange some heat. So this is meant to be some heat transfer between the hot stream and the cool stream. So what happens is if you look at the temperatures of the different streams, so if I go, if I look at from four to X, what happens is that this is a plot of temperature versus position. It starts coldest at state four, and then because of the heat transfer, the temperature increases to state X. So you get that increase in temperature. Similarly, as you go from state eight to state Y, going from right to left, it's hottest coming out of the turbine, and then it cools down as you go to state Y, and, that, and the reason it cools down is because of this heat transfer that's occurring, right? So it's dropping down. So it's kind of like a, it's a counter flow heat exchanger. Now, why do we do this? Why does it help? Well, if you go back to a, in, in, uh, to a first law analysis of the combustor, you can see that the heat that we have to put in, so this is really the fuel that you're burning, heat that you have to put in or the fuel you put in is related to the specific enthalpy at state five and specific enthalpy at state X. And just keep in mind that if we didn't have the regenerator, it would be state four, okay? So if you do a first law analysis, you see that the heat you put in is going to be the mass flow rate times specific enthalpy at five minus the specific enthalpy at X. But the specific enthalpy at X will be greater than the specific enthalpy at 4 because of the heat transfer. Again, refer back to this picture. You can see the temperature at state X is higher than the temperature at state 4 because of the regenerator. So that specific enthalpy will be higher, which means that we don't have to put nearly as much heat into the working fluid. right? So if I kind of wrote this over here, H5 minus HX will be smaller than H5 minus H4. So that means that Q dot N will be smaller. And because we, we're putting in less heat, that means that our thermal efficiency for our cycle will be improved. And really kind of the goal of the regenerator is to really improve the thermal efficiency of your whole cycle. This is where most of your thermal efficiency comes in. Intercooling and reheating help a bit with thermal efficiency, but they, what their big benefits are is reducing the power into the compressor and increasing the power out of the turbine and that just helps you read specific powers and that just helps you reduce the component size but what regeneration does is it helps increase your thermal efficiency now we quantify how well a regenerator works using a regenerator effectiveness defined here so it's specific enthalpy at x minus the specific enthalpy at four divided by the specific specific enthalpy at eight minus the specific enthalpy at four. Okay, so it's, it's actually minus H4 on both the numerator and denominator. Now, why is it defined like this? And let me go back to the picture down here. I've drawn this dashed line. This would be the ideal regenerator operation. So what happens is the fluid comes in with the temperature at state four. Okay, so that's kind of our low bound. And then as it goes through, ideally, we would reach the temperature at state 8. That's the highest temperature we can reach, right? State 8 is, has the highest temperature. So our state X here, ideally, would have the same temperature as state 8. So we would, we would, our curve would look something like this. So when we leave, we have the same temperature as state 8. And that, because that's the highest temperature, we want this, this X stream to have the highest temperature possible so that we don't have to put in as much heat into our combustor. Remember, this goes into our combustor where we're putting some heat in. So what we want to do is we want this X to have a really high temperature so we don't have to put in as much heat. The highest temperature we can get is T8. You can't go any higher than that because then you wouldn't get heat transfer from the hot stream to the cold stream. Red stream always has to have a higher temperature than the blue stream so that you get heat transfer occurring. So the ideal state X would have the same temperature as T8. And so that's why we define it like this because if X was equal to eight here, so if the regeneration was 100%, then we'd have H8 over H4 is H8 over H, or minus H4. It would just mean HX equals H8. 
Okay, so that, that's why we define the regenerator effectiveness the way we do. And typical regenerator effectiveness values are something like, I believe it's between about 40% and 80%, somewhere in that range. So the preheating of the fluid can actually improve your thermal efficiency. Remember that the thermal efficiency for your whole cycle is your net power out divided by your, your total heat in. So if we can reduce this heat into the combustor, we can improve our cycle efficiency. And again, that's, that's the main purpose of this regenerator. All right, so those are the three improvements I wanted to talk about for the Brayton cycle. So you, let me go back to the picture. It looks a lot more complicated, but you would analyze the cycle the same way that you have done all the other cycles, just applying the first law to various components in here. You calculate the thermal efficiency or just the way that you've done in the past. Probably one of the most tedious parts is finding the values at the various states. The way we do that is we use isentropic efficiency for the compressor, isentropic efficiency for the turbine, we make use of ideal gas and isentropic relations, and we assume you know the, the pressure remains constant through the heat exchangers, and combustors, and regenerator. But we analyze it much the same as what we've done before. It's just more pieces to analyze. All right, so that covers the last bit of technical material for the course. You can see it's kind of the most complicated system that we've dealt with, which seems appropriate for the very last technical lecture.